Today in Dave's Garage, we're diving deep into the intricate sequence of events that begins with a press of the power button. What actually happens when you turn on your PC? How does the PC know what to do or where to start or even begin? Sure, we all know it boots Windows off the hard drive, but how does it know how to do that? It's just a chip after all. Before you say it's all in the BIOS, how does the CPU even know where the BIOS lives? Join me today as we find out. From the Altair to the Threadripper, we'll cover everything from the early systems right on up to today's modern UEFI systems, how they work, and what the key differences are. Along the way, I'll even show you how to write a boot sector virus. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days, and today we're going to explore the sequence of events that begins when you flip the power switch on your PC. Now, I was going to insert some B-roll of a generic power button here, but then I realized that would be a travesty given that I own a real IBM PC which has the best power switch ever. Let's enjoy turning it on together now. Before we peer behind the scenes at how a PC actually starts, we should look at a few things that are even simpler than a PC, like the original MSI and Altair computers. They're quite similar and, of course, both are very simple computers. They are each comprised of a common bus that you plug cards into and then the CPU is on one of those cards. Other slots contain things like memory cards and floppy controllers. They're all interconnected by the data bus and the address bus. The CPU in both cases is the Intel 8080. Let's say you just have a bare MSI 8080 with a CPU and some memory. When you turn it on, what happens? Well, to understand it, we need to look at a little diagram of the CPU and how it's connected. Coming into the CPU is an important signal, the reset line. The reset line is set high, or to a digital one, whenever the computer is being reset. When the reset line is high, the CPU knows to clear and reset all of its internal state and then wait for the reset line to be released or to be set back to zero. To make this all work, the board on which the CPU lives has a little circuit that, when it first sees power, turns on the reset line and holds it high for a little while, like a second, until all the voltages have stabilized and all the clocks have started running. Then the reset line is released and the CPU can actually start up. When the CPU starts running, it has to know where in memory to start executing. This can be done via convention or by a reset vector. By convention, the 8080 just always starts executing whatever happens to be at address 0, which is about as simple as it gets. If we want to enter a simple program then, we can do so by depositing bytes into memory using the toggle switches on the front panel. We deposit our program, which could just be a jump instruction to some place in ROM, using the switches. Then we start the CPU and it begins executing whatever code we deposited at address 0. A couple of years later saw the introduction of the 6502 CPU, which is featured in the Kim 1, the PET series, the Commodore 64, and many more. It adds one level of indirection and flexibility to the mix. Instead of just assuming that you want to start at address 0, it loads the actual start address out of ROM. That means you must have some ROM mapped into the area known as the reset vector, which is address FFFC. When the CPU resets, it loads whatever the 16-bit contents of FFFC is and it puts it into the program counter. Once it's loaded the program counter, it just executes from there. Back to the Altair though, what if we wanted to boot it from floppy? Well, we'd first need code that knows how to talk to the floppy disk at least far enough to read the boot sector of that floppy. And unless you're prepared to enter that code with the toggle switches every power cycle, you're going to want to have it in ROM as I do. I've got a ROM up at FF00 that knows how to read and execute the boot sector from the 8-inch floppy. In theory then, all I should need to do is set FF00 as the boot address and then hit run and it should load the boot sector. That boot sector contains the code needed to read the rest of CPM into memory from the floppy. Using the front panel switches on an MSI or Altair, we can also set a startup address using the front panel switches, and thanks to how the hardware is designed, once we've examined that address, we can then hit the run switch to execute from that point on. Let's see that process in action. In order to boot an Altair 8800 off floppy, we need to enter the address of some code in ROM that knows how to load the boot sector off of the floppy and then execute it. That code lives in ROM at FF00. And so we'll enter F, which is four switches, and then another four switches for the second F, and we'll leave everything else down for zero zeros. Now we'll do a reset, and we'll examine, and when I hit run, the floppy should hit. And it does. And 
Up Boots CPM. So far, we've seen how simpler systems like the MSI and the Altair boot up, but what about the conventional PCs that most of us use? The process is a bit more complex, but equally fascinating. Unlike its ancestors, the x86 doesn't start just executing at address 0, but rather 16 bytes back from the top of memory, otherwise known as FFFF, FFF0. Your motherboard will have an EEPROM or similar chip mapped into that region of memory. At this predefined address, the BIOS code lives, and BIOS stands for Basic Input and Output System. When the CPU starts executing from FFFF, FFF0, it is essentially running the initial code stored in the BIOS. This is the beginning of the BIOS's bootstrapping process. Here's a bit of an aside. If you ever wondered why it's called bootstrapping, I explained this long ago in an old episode, but it bears repeating. In the olden days, people wore boots and often they had handles like the boots that you see firemen wear. Anyway, to put on these boots, you would pull them on by the handles. And the process of getting yourself up and going in society was known as pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps. A rather physically impossible, but a captivating visual perhaps. And so, since this process of getting yourself going by bootstrapping yourself, that phrase stuck and it just became booting, and of course, rebooting as well. The BIOS is the system firmware pre-installed on the motherboard chip. Its primary role at startup is to initialize and test the system's hardware components, like the RAM, graphics card, keyboard, and storage devices. It ensures that everything is functioning correctly and is ready for operation. When you power on a modern PC, the very first action the BIOS performs is a power on self test, or the post test. On my old PC XT, you can see the memory test tick by rather slowly. It was this slow post test that prompted one of the designers of the BIOS, David Bradley at IBM, to invent the Control Alt Delete Reboot Key sequence. That way, you could reboot the PC and it would warm start further along in the boot process, bypassing the lengthy startup tests. When you press Control Alt Delete, the keyboard controller sends a signal to the CPU, and what happens next is actually determined by the BIOS. In most PCs, it performs a warm reset. But as a point of trivia, that's a feature built into the keyboard controller in the BIOS, not built into MS DOS or Windows itself. Under modern Windows, the signal is captured and used as what is known as the SAS or Secure Attention Sequence. It takes you to a special secure desktop where you're always safe to enter your password, but it does not reset the system. Now, after the post, the BIOS searches for a bootable device. This could be a hard drive, an SSD, a CD, DVD, or even a USB drive. The order in which it searches these devices is configurable in the BIOS settings, which could be as simple as a set of dip switches or as complicated as a modern BIOS setup screen. Once it finds a bootable device, it looks for a specific sector, the master boot record on the hard drive or the equivalent on other media. This sector is crucial as it contains what's called the bootloader. The bootloader is a piece of code small enough to fit into a 512 byte sector, vital for the boot process. For MS DOS and early Windows systems, this would be the MS DOS boot sector. The BIOS loads this boot sector into the computer's memory and then transfers control to it by executing it. This handoff is the moment when the BIOS's primary role ends and the operating system begins. The MS DOS boot sector then takes over, loading the actual operating system into memory. In the case of MS-DOS, it would load the command interpreter, which is typically command.com, and then the additional system file is necessary to get the OS up and running. For more complex operating systems like Windows, the process involves loading critical system files like NT-Loader or winload.exe in the more recent versions. This sequence is the crux of the boot process. It's a well-orchestrated handover from the BIOS, the essential firmware, to the more sophisticated operating system that provides the user interface and functionality that we're all familiar with day to day. Up until a few years ago, this is pretty much all there was to know. But recently, we've seen the introduction of the UEFI BIOS, which stands for Unified Extensible Firmware Interface. It's a specification that defines a software interface between the platform itself and the operating system, and it acts as a modern replacement for the classic BIOS code. UEFI provides a more flexible and feature-rich way to initialize and configure hardware components before the operating system starts. If your computer is equipped with UEFI, your experience changes significantly from the BIOS days. UEFI presents a more user-friendly interface, often with graphical elements and support for mouse navigation. This makes it easier and more intuitive for users to configure settings. UEFI also supports larger hard drives, like over 2 terabytes, and faster boot times, which is a significant advancement over the traditional BIOS. When it comes to installing an operating system, UEFI offers a feature called Secure Boot, which helps protect the system against low-level exploits and rootkits 
that could harm your computer before the operating system even gets a chance to load. Also, UEFI can boot from drives formatted with GPT, which is the GUID partition table. Either way, it's essential for modern large capacity drives, while BIOS is limited to the old master boot record or MBR format. Another aspect where you'd notice a difference is in the booting process. UEFI can store boot information in a special partition called the EFI system partition, making the boot process more robust and less reliant on specific disk sectors, as is the case with BIOS. This translates to fewer boot issues and easier recovery when problems do occur. So to summarize the PC boot process from end to end, here's what happens. When first powered up, the motherboard raises and holds the reset line on the CPU for a few moments. Then it releases it to let the CPU begin the boot process. The CPU looks at ROM address FFFF, FFF0, which is mapped into the BIOS chip. And then it begins executing code at that location. The BIOS chip decides which one is the boot disk, and then it loads the first 512 byte sector from that disk, known as the boot sector, into a buffer, and then executes it. Now that code then proceeds to read in the rest of the operating system from disk. When the operating system loads, control is usually turned over to you, the user. Let's say we wanted to write a bootable game, which effectively makes the game the operating system itself. Creating such a bootable system would require the following steps. First, you would need to provide that 512-byte boot sector that gets written to the special boot sector of your floppy disk. It will load the actual game. Modern x86 CPUs all start up in real mode like it's 1977 all over again, and since you'll be likely using a much more modern Intel CPU, this is the point that you'd now switch to 32 or 64-bit mode. And next, once the boot sector is loaded and ready to go, it's executed and your code inside of it then has to load the rest of the game. And that means you either have to lay out your disk format in a way that's simple enough for a bootloader to handle, or you'd have to load intermediate code that then knows how to use the file system and load data from the disk as normal. Either way, since we're not running atop a real operating system, we can't even read files off the disk without writing the code to do so ourselves. And that alone would be a good indication of why most games have been written to run atop an operating system like MS-DOS or Windows. In that case, the operating system takes care of all the work for you and you're simply loaded as an application within it and you get full access to all the facilities of the operating system from the disk and file access to memory management and more. Of course, a few of you may have already thought of something else you could do. You could write a boot sector virus. In fact, my classic IBM PC even came infected with a boot sector virus known as the stone virus. The stone virus, which emerged in the late 1980s, spread through what was, at the time, an unsuspecting medium, the floppy disk. When a computer was booted using an infected floppy disk, the stone virus sprang into action. Once the stoned boot sector was loaded, it quietly copied the original boot sector of the hard drive, a critical segment containing that necessary code for starting the computer, off to another location on the disk. This was actually a clever move, ensuring that it wouldn't destroy the computer's ability to boot up normally, which would have raised immediate alarms. Once the original boot sector was safely tucked away, the virus replaced it with its own code in the custom boot sector. This strategic placement meant that the stoned virus would be one of the first pieces of code executed every time the computer was turned on, embedding itself into the system's startup routine. Once its boot sector had been executed, the virus then lay dormant, hidden within the system. But each time the computer was started, or every time a new floppy disk was inserted, the virus's code would run first, silently ensuring its continued presence. And every time a new floppy disk was inserted into the system, it would spread. It was a cunning design as the original boot sector was still used to boot the system, and so you wouldn't detect the change, but only after the virus had executed its own code, allowing the virus to remain undetected and active in the computer's memory. The spread of the stone virus was equally insidious. It took advantage of the common practice of sharing and transferring data via floppy disks. When an infected computer accessed a clean floppy disk, the virus would transfer its code to the boot sector of the disk. Thus, whenever this newly infected disk was then used to boot a different computer, the virus extended its reach, infecting machine after machine in a quietly efficient manner. Through this simple yet effective mechanism, the stoned virus became one of the notable early examples of computer viruses, demonstrating the vulnerabilities of systems at the time and paving the way for the development of more sophisticated cybersecurity measures. If you found today's episode to be any combination of informative or entertaining, I'd be honored if you'd consider subscribing to my channel. I'm not selling anything and I don't have any Patreons. I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage. This little chair will be waiting for one of you.
and a rocking chair for another who likes to rock, and a big armchair for two to curl up in. All next time on Dave's Garage.